Hey, welcome, Darian Minigod. It is so good to have you here, champion. Good to talk to you. It's great spending time together. This is uh, chapter six of nine chapters of the book, Darian. And uh, thanks for going on this journey with me. And uh, whenever I talk about this book and I'm with some people, I say my wife's husband wrote a great book because you don't want to talk about your own stuff. But man, as I've gone through this, there were some things really about 20 years of life and ministry and business that went into this and uh, really packed with a lot of stories. Some we'll get into in the next couple of weeks. Some we've already covered. Let me go to, right away to Psalm 56, and David will put that up. Be gracious to me, God, for man tramples me. He fights and oppresses me all day long. My adversaries trample me all day, for many arrogantly fight against me. When I am afraid, I will trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust, I will not fear. What can man do to me? Bam! There it is right there. That's why we're doing daring. I'll tell you why, why we're doing daring in the whole nine-part series on Monday Night Men and about speaking up boldly and courageously is that, uh, frankly, I'm just sick of soft men. I'm just tired of it, tired of flaccid souls and and uh, feckless spirits. That means lacking initiative. Uh, men who suck up the oxygen for no good reason. Men who can't take a punch, who cry laying on the ground like an Italian soccer player. You know, I mean, that's, that's supposed to be a joke, actually, but it's, uh, you know, those guys that sit around, ah, this happened and that happened, and whining. I, I, I feel like sometimes we're living in the most uh, unfocused, obtusely children, uh, spiritual era in modern history. I mean, come on, guys, take a punch. Stand up. Let's do this thing. You fall down, you get back up. That's why we have hashtag CMN Brotherhood. Hashtag CMN Brotherhood. Because we help each other get back up. Get back in the game, back in the race. Chill out for a minute. You know, I mean, that's why you need a band of brothers. You need somebody to tell you, dude, you, you need to take a break. <laughs> You're not yourself. What is it, that Snickers commercial, I think, Jesse? Is that right? Does, you're not yourself. You're somebody else. And then it comes back to who you are. And, and the fact is, is a, fact is, let me just say this. Flaccidity is not attractive. We need some men with spiritual gonads. Men whose hearts are focused on Christ and whose feet are focused in reality and are fearless in the face of adversity. That's what the world needs. A man like you, full of the power of the Holy Spirit. Come on, somebody. Darren, as always, Bruce is with us here who handles all of our online product, media, travel speaks. Uh, Jesse here with uh, Go Man Productions. A tremendous. Uh, in fact, you guys have won some awards. You just won like an advertising. Telly Award. Award. Fantastic. Well done. David Miner, who's, of course, been nominated for Grammys and He's our editor, so forth and so on. Bunch of, what a great team. You know, and I think of focus because this is uh, Daring Men Have Endurance is uh, chapter six, endurance. But endurance actually has to have a target. In other words, you don't endure unless you know you're going somewhere. Yeah. So you have to live a targeted life in order to have a, a resilient life, a life of endurance, You've got to cut away distractions. You've got to be focused. I'll give you a story on focus. Um, my, uh, my uncle Dave Wharton, uh, great uncle Dave Wharton, had a farm that's down where the Parks Mall is in Arlington, Texas. Had a farm there, large one. I came as a little kid, first time 10 years old from the West Coast. <laughs> never been on a tractor. Never run around. My cousin was there, Monty, and we'd go around shooting 22s at stuff and catching gophers and just, it was an amazing time for a 10-year-old, and I was back again when I was 12 and then 14. But my Uncle Dave, when I was 10, he put me on the seat of a tractor, big one of those big old giant tractors with the double front wheels and a big old giant thing with a metal seat, you know, big giant metal seat. Now you only see them in antique stores. And uh, so he motioned to me. He said, come on up, come on up. You know, pull me up. And he's out there plowing. And he's plowing this field, getting ready. He's planting corn. And it gets me up there, and 
sits me down on his lap and I'm you know, jostling with him, you know, and that tractor's pretty amazing. And he makes the turn, turns around and says, grab the wheel. I'm like, oh man. So I grab it and now it starts jerking, you know? And I look down trying to miss the dirt clods, right? Cause it's, it's hitting these dirt clods that are in the ground and the wheels would be jerked different ways. And, and so I'm looking at the wheel, looking at the tire and, and he's got the throttle and, you know, the, and all that stuff going. And we get to the end of that particular field and we turn around and we look back and dude, I mean, it was like a Friday night drunk. It was like, man, I thought I had ruined my Uncle Dave's farm. I'm like, it just was crooked like this because I'd been looking down at, at, at what I was doing right there at the tires. My Uncle Dave did something very wise. He said, uh, Paul, do you see that? You see that fence post down there? See, yes, sir, I did. The one with the, the turtle on it. <laughs> no, I'm teasing. The, the one right there. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The one right there. Okay. So, yeah, he said, keep your eyes on that fence post and grab the wheel again and let's go back and uh now it didn't look perfect but the fact is every time something jerked i had my eyes on a target and a direction and that is what following christ is all about i have a target i have a goal i have a place i'm going i'm going to become a better man I'm going to be a better husband. I'm going to I'm going to have a great family. I'm going to grow great, raise up great children. Why? Because I got a target. What is that target? To be Christ-like in everything I do. To be excellent in everything I do. If I fall down, what happens? I get back up. Get back on the tractor. Start steering. That is focus. And that's why when I talk about uh, men who uh, who are feckless or or they're soft, it's because they don't have a target for their life. They're not, they're not sure, you know, why am I here? And I've talked about it before. The first thing to ask is not what do I do, but who am I? Why am I here? Why am I here? What's my design? What's, and then who am I? And now what do I do out of that design and, uh, and then definition and then decision making, right? Design, definition, decisions. Endurance is trusting in the long game. Listen, I, there's so many people that want something right now. Trusting in the long game. See, endurance is taught. It comes with identity. That's why the whole fatherhood piece is so important. It's, it's like uh, you with your son or your daughter. And they do something wrong and you go, no, that's not what, that's not the way things are in the O'Reilly house. As Jesse was on camera. That's not the way an O'Reilly acts. Your son does something negative. You go, no, no, no. That's not the way we do it in this house. That's not who we are. So identity is given most often by a father. Uh, I, I remember my daughter, Lindsay, when she was uh, growing up and she was a cheerleader and a gymnast. And I remember going into her freshman year of high school. She was all excited about it. And then she didn't make the cheerleading squad. It was, that was a huge disappointment. I could still feel and sense the emotion of that moment. And then we said, Lindsay, what do you want to do? And she said, I want to go back to gymnastics twice a week, not just once, twice. There were certain moves they wanted her to do she wasn't able to do. She dedicated that next year. She went twice a week gymnastics, doing all these crazy things and things and all this stuff. Now her daughter, one of her daughters, uh, Dylan, is now a gymnast at level four at uh, the age of eight. And, uh, but Lindsay went back and went after it because it's kind of like, that's who we are. It's, I didn't even have to preach to her. She it just, she just already knew that that's who she was. The identity that came down from her father and she ended up getting a, going, not only being on the team. She's an amazing woman. Amen. And she ended up getting a scholarship to college, went through some things and now uh, as a teacher in school herself with four children and uh, coming up on her 20th, well, just had uh, her 20th wedding anniversary. See, identity in Christ, we, we get our identity in Christ because it's been passed from father to son. I'll give, you, I'll give you a great story. Number two, even elephants need a father figure. Let's title it that way, even elephants. And it's, it's a great, I've got the full report here 
uh, from the BBC. In 1994, in the Pl Pillensburg uh, Park, it was the Pillensburg National Park in South Africa. In 1994, 20 white rhinos were found dead, killed in a two month period. Highly unusual and not by poachers. They've been killed by other animals. Over the next two years, another 20 were killed. Tried to figure it out. And finally they found a young male killing a white rhino because it looked like elephants were killing the rhinos. They couldn't believe it. As it turned out, they had a group of 36 young teenage uh, male elephants that were on a rampage. It was like a gang. There were like a couple gangs of these elephants and they'd find a rhinos, they'd pin them down and then gore them. Another one would come and gore them. And they found, and, and here's what they found out. These were young survivors that had been taken out of Kruger National Park. They were orphans. There were 18 to 24 of them, actually, that were taken to Kruger National Park. There were some that were younger, but this is these first gangs, 18 to 24 of them. They were take, taken to Pillensburg because they were orphans. And so they just took them there. Well, what ended up happening is they didn't have a father figure. Watch this. This is amazing. Gus Van Dyke is the ecologist who discovered this. He said, when a young male is growing up, he moves into his sexuality. He can move into his sexuality between the ages of 12 and 20. He said, but when there's an older bull between 35 and 40, that older bull being there will cause that disruption because, in fact, he said, what the younger male will do was move into a, a experience heightened aggression. They are flooded with reproductive hormones and they swagger, trying to make themselves look taller. They have strong smelling liquid that comes out of them. And all of a sudden they're like, hey, man, I'm, I'm here. I'm looking for a mate. But when a father figure is in, in there, is there near them, immediately that thing happens for about one day and it's gone. And they don't get it back till they're 35, which is when they're mature and they're not aggressive and they actually reproduce in the herd. But the father figures weren't there. So the young elephants is called coming into their must. The young elephants, the young males had lost their way because there was no father figure to teach them. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. And so that's, and you can find that story. It's, it's unique to uh, elephants, the must. But man, these, these guys, these, these teenagers, think about them, eight foot tall and weighing six tons. And they're on a rampage. They're just killing everything. And, and putting a father figure, in fact, they only put a half dozen uh, of the bull elephants, 35 to 40 year old bull elephants in Pillensburg. And immediately they said like overnight, bam, everything changed. In fact, from that point forward, not another rhino was killed. Isn't that amazing? Even elephants need a father figure. <laughs> How much more so do you and I? We need that identity that comes from somebody who trains us and teaches. Endurance is taught. And when you don't have a father in your life, you find you need a father figure. That's why coaches are so important. That's why I uh, encourage uh, men of God to become coaches in your local sports. Don't tell me you're too busy. Find a way to carve it out. Uh, my friend Steve Weinberg and I, who just recently went to be with the Lord, Steve and I coached our Little League team for a couple of years, and both of us were so busy. He is a lawyer, uh, previously had been a doctor, became a lawyer, very successful, very, and he was actually, actually in George W. Bush's uh, cabinet. But we, we coached those teams, and when I was gone, he was there. When he was gone, I was there. We had some other coaches, and uh, we just got it done. And... We need to take the time to do that. Pass on that. Endurance. First Thessalonians 1.3. As we pray to our God and Father about you, we think of your faithful work, your loving deeds, and the enduring hope you have because of our Lord Jesus Christ. Endurance is all about hope. Enduring hope. What's hope? Hope is a substance that brings faith, right? Amen. Built by faith. I can't think of a better uh, talk about a man of God who hung on by hope and endurance into a vision and a target and a dream. There's an American football player named Kurt Warner. Some of you, if you're here in the United States, you would know who he is because he's already uh, been tabbed uh, to be in the Hall of Fame, most valuable player in the Super Bowl. 
But in 1994, at 27 years of age, listen to this, in, in 1994, okay, he's at this point 23, 24 years old, he, he, and, and he's out of college football. He's working in a supermarket in Cedar Falls, Iowa, for $5.50 an hour. And then at night, still working out at his old college. Still working out, pumping weights, throwing the football, doing this stuff. Finally, he gets a job in what's called the Arena Football League when he's 25 years old. Okay? Now, most guys have already, I mean, have already moved on. If you're not going to be in, you're out. Arena Football League, 1998. Now he's 27. Caught the attention of the Rams, and they sent him overseas. And they go, yeah, yeah, you're good. Bam, you can go to Europe and play. So he goes to Europe, 1998. Now watch this. 1999, he ends up through a series of circumstances as a quarterback for the St. Louis Rams, going to the Super Bowl, being the MVP, and winning the Super Bowl. Is that crazy? Yes. Now here's what he said. Here's what I said. I've got his, I've got his quote. He said, people think this season, in other words, it's the first time anybody saw him. All of a sudden, there he is, right? I don't know if you remember that. There he is. Bam. And uh, he said, people think this is the first time I touched the football. He said, they don't realize I've been doing this for years, over 20 years. Just not on this level because I never got a chance. He said, since, he said, I had tough times, but you don't just sit there and say, wow. I was talking groceries five years ago and look at me now. He said, you don't think about it. You just keep working. He was stocking groceries for $5.50 an hour, and five years later was the MVP of the Super Bowl. Why? Well, he didn't quit. He just stayed with it. He endured. I, uh, I have great appreciation for that, man. He's a, he's a uh, on-camera commentator now and gives a lot of his time to uh, the underprivileged and uh, children who need help and the guys who need to be inspired by that. That's a great story to tell to a young a man. Page 71, page 71. It's a great quote. Page 71. Calvin Coolidge said this. President, uh, one of the former presidents of the United States said this. Nothing in this world can take the place of persistence. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than unsuccessful men with great talent. Genius will not. Unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. Education will not. The world is full of educated derelicts. I think I would have said educated fools. Nonetheless, persistence, determination alone are omnipotent. Don't quit. Now look at page 102. Page 102 is one of my favorite stories uh, of somebody who has gone through stuff and endured. And actually, the name of his ship was the Endurance. I'm talking, of course, about Ernest Shackleton. And Ernest Shackleton was trying to be the first man uh, to attempt the crossing of Antarctica in 1915, okay? So he takes a crew, and you can read all about 54 men. They end up sailing to the Antarctic, and they are stuck for 497 days, 497 days. Now, about 460, about 430 days into it, Shackleton and a few other men say, hey, we've got to get out of here. So he and four other men take off going and looking for help. They end up, the last uh, couple miles, were, the only way they knew they could get to this one particular outpost to get help was to climb over these mass. I mean, we're talking back in the day. This is the 1900s. They don't have all the technical gear we have today. They climbed over an ice mountain. In fact, the last uh, 36 hours, they didn't sleep. They found safeties, took, took ship, found safety, took ships back to, the, to get his men. He didn't end up being the, the first one to cross, but he is remembered as a man of endurance. He did some other great things about, her, about that, but bottom line is he had a target. First of all, he's got the target. He wants to be the guy that crosses Antarctica. He's got a target, and that target kept him going. And you can, oh, they found, they actually just found the ship a few months ago, earlier this year. They found the Endurance. You can look that up. Might have been a National Geographic uh, uh, thing. You know, uh, Ernest Shackleton. You know, this is an amazing story of a man, Endurance. I'm going to go through page 104 
in a moment about daring men have focus. What sets a man apart from a man who, who seems to tip over and, and is always whining about stuff and is flaccid? What tips a man over? And what is it? It's men who hang out with dangerous men. Daring men always hang out with daring men. So I want to invite you to our annual Lion's Roar Summit. It happens the first weekend of November every year in Dallas, Texas. Watch this. I hope you'll be with us at the Lions War Summit this year. Uh, it won't be the same without you. And it is a place to hang out with daring men. Can't tell you how many relationships has be, have begun. Brothers, uh, men who have met and become friends, families take vacations together, they've gone and done ministry together, traveled together, and come travel with us. Hashtag CMN Brotherhood. You can see on social media everything that's going on. Hashtag CMN, Christian Men's Network. CM, don't go to CNN Brotherhood. That's the wrong one. CMN Brotherhood. Hashtag CMN Brotherhood. Okay, I want to close with pages 104 and 105. There is so much here. Let me start with, with this quote right off the bat because I, I love this. Whatever captures and holds your attention will eventually control the direction of your life. Whatever captures and holds your attention will eventually control the direction of your life. I'll give you a, a little picture of that. What, what, I mean, occasionally you go to the gym, right? Or you should. Occasionally you think about it. Now, I think we all do something, right? We, we walk, we go to the gym, whatever it is. We do something, we eat right, try to maintain some level of health. That is a responsibility we have as stewards or as trustees of our physical body that God's given to us. Now, if I go to the gym and work out, I work out, I do treadmill, I do some weights, do different things. And uh, Judy and I try to go about four times a week and try to do something even in the interim. I've got my Fitbit on. I'm always watching my steps, make sure I have them. I've got not a whole lot sitting here today, but nonetheless. Uh, one of the things about that is this, you, you're working out, you, you got a purpose, but what if, what if somebody said, hey, by the way, there's an exhibition bout next week. We signed you up for it, and you're going to be fighting. You're going to be boxing. Dude, really? Yeah, and you have to do it. A lot of money involved. You're in it, and uh, don't worry about it. The other guy's Mike Tyson. Not a problem. And what if you only had 30 days? Now, would that give you a little more purpose? Would you, would you be like working out at weights? I think I'd be working out on, on ducking and running. Yeah. I think it was just ducking. How do I... You know, uh, but, but that gives you purpose. So when a man has purpose, he can endure. You work out differently when you know you have a purpose. That's why a targeted life and a life that has direction, the man has strength. Why? He's working out something for a particular purpose. You know, and whatever it is that captures and holds your attention will eventually control the direction of your life. I, I love this quote by Michelangelo. They asked him about his, some of his great sculpture, you know, sculpting and sculptures that he'd done. He said, really, all I do is chip away that what do doesn't belong. Man, I love that. All I really do is chip away what doesn't belong. In other words, live our lives not with greater intensity, but greater intentionality. Targeted. Where am I headed? One who is, this is Sun Tzu, the ancient uh, Chinese strategist. One who is confused in his purpose cannot respond to his enemy. One who is confused in his purpose cannot respond to his enemy. We all need a target. It's like Joshua. You know, be of great courage, Joshua. Go after Joshua. Why? Because he had a goal. His goal was to take the promised land, to, to take Jericho. I mean, you look, at the, you look at the great men of the Bible. They all had obstacles to overcome. Here's the deal. In your, is, you know, Tommy, uh, big Tommy Sarodnik saying, if you're on a path of life and there's no obstacles, you're on the wrong path. 
Marcus Aurelius, I, I love this quote. This is page 104 of the book, Daring. Marcus Aurelius says, the true worth of a man is to be measured by the objects he pursues. The true worth of a man is to be measured by the objects he pursues. What are you pursuing? What are you going after? You know the old line, you know, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. I remember watching, uh, Bruce is a, and Jess here both, we're all sports fans, and we all saw at one point Nolan Ryan pitch, and uh, maybe you were there, and, and you could hear him as he pitched, and he pitched so many years in baseball, over 20 years, and had a great career. What was it about this man that was, that was so powerful? What was powerful about Nolan Ryan is he had a focus and he cut away everything else. And he did the same thing every time. You watch his delivery, his mechanics. He, his Even after every game, he would go get on a, on a uh, bike, stationary bike, and he'd ride the bike, keep himself, get himself ready for the next one. He's focused. He's cutting away all the distractions, all the things that would capture his attention. Focused. A man with endurance is a man who's focused on where he's headed. Number seven, close. Acts 2.17, in the last day, God says, in the last day days. I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Bam! That's part six out of nine parts, nine chapters in the book, Daring. A call to courageous manhood to stand and boldly confront the culture who's turned its back on Christ. God's called you to do that. You're the man that people are looking for to stand up. And I believe you're the right man. I think you can do it. Remember, hope is alive. Hope has a name. Hope's name is Jesus. God bless you, bro. Stay daring. I'll see you next time.